Coming to you live from the Great Hall in Toronto, Canada, it's Long Night with Vish Khanna. Tonight, Vish welcomes writer Carl Wilson, rapper Shad, and Jasmine Burke of Weaves. Your house band is The Bicycles. My name is James Keast, and here's your host, Vish Khanna. Hi. Welcome to Long Night, everyone. My name is Vish. I'm your host, and uh, this is my sidekick, James Keys. James, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm very well. It's nice to have you. What do you think of this deal we have going on? We have a talk show now. I know. This is the best dressed I've ever seen either of us. <laughs> yeah, I think we gussied up pretty well. The room's gussied. The whole thing's gussied. Yeah, it's nice to have you. Is everyone having a good time so far? <laughs> so, James, we are... Uh, we were talking about rock and roll. Yeah, rock and roll night. And you are the editor of Exclaim magazine, which yep. is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. <laughs> 25 years covering Canadian music, and you've been the editor in chief. And other music, too, not just. No, Canadian. that's true, sorry. Yeah, that's true. I should know this. I've been writing for the magazine as well for 13 years. <laughs> Yes, you cover every genre of music, and yeah. you've been the editor-in-chief primarily the whole time, really. 23 years, yeah. 23 years, this guy. Come on. Come on. I haven't held down a job for 23 years. That's amazing. I didn't even know you could do that anymore. Anybody here have a job? <laughs> Anyone no. hold a job for more than 20 years? No, see? Yeah. We're all doomed. Anyway. Or I count as the oldest. <laughs> that's right. One of my uh, questions for you, because you curate a monthly magazine, a cross-genre international music magazine, do you find it more difficult to include rock and roll artists that the general public are going to be interested in these days? Uh, I wouldn't say that we have a mandate to reach. We, d we don't have a quota of rock and roll that we have to hit. Uh, so I'm not that, I haven't been that concerned about it. Uh, I haven't, but, but to be honest, there haven't been it hasn't been the best couple of years in terms of uh, interesting new good rock bands, but there's no shortage of interesting good music, so we just cover that instead. Right. Um, in terms of this being a, an unusual sort of lull for rock bands, speaking as somebody who's been doing this since uh, you know the 200s, uh, I would say that this very much feels like 1999, early 2000 again, when dance music had really dominated um, and a variety of uh, sort of other f uh, forms, whether be they uh, hip hop or dance music or, or uh, you know, the rise of various um, global scenes. Uh, and, and there was a lot of lamenting about, oh, rock music's dead. And then 18 months later, you know, we had the White Stripes and the Strokes and the Hives right, and there yeah. was a rock renaissance. The whole thing is cyclical. We're just at uh, what I believe is the ebb of the the pre-rock revival. Right. Well, I appreciate that insight. We're going to get into it quite a bit today. And I thought it might be a, a good opportunity to poll the audience on some way, in some ways, get a couple representatives from the crowd for a new game that we call the three-second rule. <laughs> Welcome. Hello. How are you? Good. What's your name? Allie. Allie. Nice to meet you. Andrew. Andrew. Nice to meet you. Do you two know each other? Me too. Oh, how do you know each other? College. Uh, yeah. College? Oh, where'd you go to school? Uh, U of T. U of T. It's nice, the U of T, isn't it? It's nice. Did you, did you go to a lot of shows? Concert? I did. Yeah. yeah. Did you, have you gone to one recently? I saw Titus Andronicus. At a rock Please. band. You're a rock fan? You're rock fans? Sure, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I want to... You seemed uncertain about that. I'm sure. Okay, good. <laughs> That's all that matters. Okay, I want to explain the rules of this game to you and our audience watching, presumably at home. The rules are you each will answer the same question in sequence, one after another, and you only have three seconds to answer the question. The clock starts once I yell go after I ask the question. So I ask the question, I yell go, then you go. Okay. You understand? You have three seconds. And then uh, if you don't get it in three seconds, I'm going to yell next, and then you have to go. And we're only going to do two rounds of this game. Okay? Do you understand? Yes. I understand. Okay. Do you guys understand? Yeah. Do you understand? I wasn't paying attention. I thought that's what I thought. <laughs> Okay, here's the first question. Are you ready? Who's going for oh, it? She's going to, you're going to have to, yeah. Share, can you share the mic? We can share. Yeah. Okay, you share the Ali, Ali's going to share the mic. Okay, ready? You ready for the first question? Ready. Who is currently the biggest rock star on the planet? Go! Three. Next! Same question. Yeah, the same question. That's the rule. I'm sorry. Uh, Dave Grohl. 
Dave Grohl, interesting. Nothing from the crowd, okay. <laughs> no one's really interested in Dave Grohl. You think the Foo Fighters are the biggest rock stars in the world? I didn't say that. You did imply that by <laughs> saying Dave Grohl. Okay, would you, you've covered Dave Grohl and exclaim, right? Sure. He's big. Yeah. And did that get a lot of uh, traffic? Uh, uh, you know, I don't remember the last time we covered Dave Grohl. Right, right. It might have been a while. Not enough, okay. All right, that was good. Allie, nothing. 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 You couldn't think of anything, right? Like, who's big now? Yeah. Or who's like a big star that's still alive? I don't know. I, yeah, it was I, I a guess vague question. You're blaming I, me I for this? Okay. Yeah. I understand. Okay, here's the next one. Again, Allie, you're going to have to share the okay. mic. And we'll start, again, three seconds, okay? Here's the next question. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Who is currently the biggest hip-hop star on the planet? Allie. Drake. That's an answer. Kanye. That's also an answer. Do you see what happened there? You didn't have an answer for rock. You had some kind of answer for rock. And then both of you, hip-hop, you knew off the top of your head. That's telling. Right? I think so, yeah. Okay, good. That's the end of the game. Thank you very much. <laughs> you can go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Well, what did you make of that? Uh, I was trying to think of my own answer. What would your answer have been for which one? Uh, well, I think Drake probably for hip hop, but uh, I, I still don't really, there isn't an obvious answer for the biggest rock star. I, I uh, think that's true. Biggest living rock star probably, you know, we're into the Bono Mick Jagger kind of range, but in terms of current relevance, Exactly, yeah. I asked some people on the street yesterday and one woman answered Janis Joplin. What? <laughs> Janis is dead. Long dead. Long dead. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to explore the uh, state of rock and roll further with tonight's panelists, Shad, Jasmine Burke of Weaves, and Carl Wilson. We're going to take a short break and when we return, Carl Wilson will be here. So stick around, everybody. Thanks for being here. Promotional consideration provided by Long and McQuaid Musical Instruments, serving musicians in Canada since 1956, with 75 locations from coast to coast. Visit long-mcquaid.com for info on cities, stores, and services. Welcome back to Long Night. Our first guest is an esteemed music writer and cultural critic based in Toronto and the author of this hugely influential book, Let's Talk About Love, Why Other People Have Such Bad Taste. At the end of the year, Billboard magazine published his essay, Is Rock Still Relevant in 2016? Please give a warm welcome to the great Carl Wilson, everyone. <laughs> Carl. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. It's nice to have you on our, our show. And uh, have you ever been to a, a long night taping before? A long night taping? No, I, I think this is the first one, isn't it? Well, I, yeah, <laughs> that's true. I just was trying to pretend it wasn't. But anyway, thank you for being here. Now, let's, let's get to your piece. What prompted you to write the, this piece about rock and roll? Well, it actually sort of came from the editors of Billboard originally. They were they came to me and were like, we want to do the ultimate rock is dead piece. Um, and I started reporting that out a little bit and um, eventually kind of concluded that the thesis was a little too simplistic and that we had to nuance it, which is why we ended up with the word relevant. Even that I'm not that in love with. I think the question is just whether the, the rock age is over and the whether, you know, rock now is kind of a heritage music a kind of, firm, you know, one of the things I say in the piece is a better question is, is rock jazz? Right. You know, it's just, does rock now fall into that kind of venerable form rather than, and you know, you look at the, you look at the charts and you look at commercial success in the past 20 years and rock just doesn't have that kind of youth radio kind of impact um, that it once did. And it's, it's moved into a different realm. And it doesn't mean that there's not lots of great work being done in rock. It's just that it's, it's not central to the culture in the way that it once was. And do you have a sense of 
why that is? Like, why has rock fallen off the way when other genres are doing better? I think that there's a couple of things. I mean, one is just that it's the natural process of pop culture, right? You know, we don't expect swing dancing to still be at the top of the charts now. And, well, you know, speak for yourself. <laughs> and rock fan. is like, depending on how you count, like it's like a 60, 70 year old form. Right. So it would be strange to think that it's just eternally going to have this dominant position. And what we're seeing is it's sort of age, audiences aging out and you end up with these kind of heritage acts, um, you know, as people were mentioning in the, in the three second rule yeah. game, yeah. you know, the people you can name off the top of your head are from bands that have been around for decades. Well, and James, as you mentioned time, and James mentioned that it's cyclical, right? So you're writing this piece about whether rock is, is still relevant now or is dead now, and you express some discomfort with that because we might be on the cusp of something right now, right? We it's, might be, we might be, and never say never. But I think that, you know, when you talk, of James, about the late 90s, you know, that was kind of a, a period after rock had already been through a revival commercially in the mid early mid-90s, just before which people were saying maybe that was it already. Right. So to me, it's like, how many, how many cycles can you go through before it starts? You know, it's kind of like, you, you have the boy who cried wolf, but eventually a wolf comes, right? And so you can't prove that there's no wolf just by saying that wolf has been cried before. Remember, right. remember when there were all those wolf bands? <laughs> That's a good point. It was like Wolf Parade and the other ones. I can't remember the other ones, but yeah, that AIDS might be... Wolf. That might yeah, be yeah. AIDS Wolf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing them up. Um, well, in the piece, you also discuss how we consume and categorize music and how that has changed, right? And it's fair to say that genre signifiers like rock are less important because we're also... I mean, most people, I think, consider themselves well-rounded generalists now. You're expected to know every show on Netflix and everything all the time. Has rock suffered particularly because of this? I don't think it's that rock suffers particularly from it. Um, I think all genres kind of lose some definition in this streaming age and where, you know, instead of collecting a particular set of artists, you, you can just sort of click around to wherever you want to go. Right. Um, and so the sensibility that people, especially young people who've grown up in that kind of way of consuming music, have just doesn't sort of go with genre boxes nearly as much. There's still like passionate fans of particular subcultures, I think. You know, metal fans care about being metal fans. But in some ways, you know, it's been a long time since anybody cared about being like a rock fan in general. Yeah. You know, that, like there were, it was always substreams kind of against each other. You know, they're the last time that people just said that they were like, rock fans was probably the 70s. You know? But when you post, when your piece started circulating, did you get a lot of blowback from people being like, what are you talking about? Rock's fine. Like, were people angry about the piece? There were people who were angry. I think that people, you know, I, but for reasons that I feel are understandable. Like, people want to defend the, the artists who that they feel are doing great work. And people, like, very understandably, and I think this is something from rock culture that remains relevant, is to say that commercial success and like relevance to the zeitgeist or however you want to put it, just isn't the necessarily most important measure of artistic worth. Right. And there was a lot of pushback on that level. And like that I have no quarrel with. And in some ways, you know, the world in which rock still kind of thrives in a kind of like underground indie music world has, still has a lot to bring to the culture and right. you know in some ways the commercial side of music at this point could use some more of that kind of experimental energy or at least the affirmation that you know sort of non-commerciality has it has more value we are living in an age where access is really different than we we've, we've invoked the phrase rock star and i feel like the playing field has been leveled for stardom right we've seen so many like normal people become stars we've seen so many people be be able to tweet at their favorite person, like their favorite celebrity, and get a response. I feel like stardom has changed a little bit. Do you agree? Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. I mean, I think the category of star is kind of a tired one. Um, you know, there are celebs, there are memes, there are whatever you want to put. There are, like, figures. But at the same time, there are people whose kind of ubiquity is meaningful in a way that the rock star once was meaningful, right? Yeah. Like when we talk about Kanye or when we talk about Beyonce, those are people who inspire kind of debate and heated feelings from all sides in ways that, you know, 
Dylan might have at one time, you know, the same kind of obsessive dissection. Sure. We still sort of have that. Passion. Yeah, well, and also cultural heft, you know, cultural relevance, the fact that the people who stir things up and the people who, who shift the terms of things a little bit, you know, and that hasn't been rock and roll for arguably a really, really long time. In the piece, you talk about um, the lack of successful rock musicians in, say, the Billboard chart at award season. Is any of this about money? Are we equating uh, our aesthetic viability with commercial success here? Well, that, that's, the, I mean, that, that's the danger and the thing, that, the thing that, as, as I was saying, there's some pushback about the piece. And it, I, that's, again, I was talking about sort of cultural Capital? impact. Yeah. 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 You know, that that's, that's, where, that's where I think it's, the difference is. You know, when Arcade Fire won the Grammy in 2011, the primary response in social media was, who is Arcade Fire? Right, right. <laughs> right? Like, arguably one of the most successful, certainly in the past decade or so, rock bands. And the majority of the, of the general public kind of had this, huh, who? reaction and that's and so that tells you something but what you know? does that say that was a band that it could sell at madison square garden they've been on snl by that point twice i think they were big like how do you get bigger than a band like that and still oh you're just i'm just proving your argument right now <laughs> they were as big as you could get but still not a household name yeah i mean they had a big niche a very big niche yeah. right and and we forget you know, also, if you sort of live in this, that subculture where they're big, you forget how vast the outside of that subculture is. Right. And so when, you know, and it's those moments where those things run up against each other that suddenly go, oh, I see. They're not, they're not famous, famous, famous. Right. <laughs> right. Know? Now, you're a, a, a very open-eared music fan. I know this about you. Are you a rock guy? Yeah. That's, I, you know, that's part of why the subject is interesting to me. You know, in some ways, one of the things about this debate that I wonder about is I'm like, oh, well, like how many people under 35 even care right. about this argument at all? But like I came up in, in a rock world and in a sort of like artsy, forward thinking, experimental rock world. And that kind of shaped my sensibilities in a lot of ways. But I think that there's a tendency among rock age people to kind of hold on to the idea that that's where the center of relevance is. And it's, it has some damaging effects, that generation gap. You know, it's, it kind of dates back to the people who, are, who said in the beginning and are still saying that, you know, rap isn't music. Like, right, that, yeah. that kind of divide is a, is a dangerous one. And I think, you know, it's worthwhile talking about the fact that rock has drifted away from being in contact well, we're all about the realities. we're all about the racial and demographic uh, lines these days, it seems, and yeah, yeah, and that's the other thing is you know, in some ways I think it's healthy to proclaim the passing of the rock age because the rock age was also a time in which like the model of like a rebellious, relevant, dangerous thing was like four guys with guitars, yeah, yeah, and I think right now it's good to say like oh, there's something a little ridiculous about that, <laughs> like four white guys with guitars, and like maybe think that there's that there are horizons beyond that that are worth thinking about. Okay, so does the death of rock and roll, as you call it, does it sadden you? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I think I feel neither happy nor sad about it. Like, it's, when it's more of a sort of scientific or historiography kind of recognition of like, oh, let's, let's agree that like the rock age is over and that we're somewhere else now without discarding all of the great things that rock music has brought and that rock music still brings, but just sort of say, you know, it's 2016 and these are the 2017 now. Yeah. <laughs> these are the chicks. Yeah. yeah, right. You know? All right, well, I appreciate your insight there, Carl. We're going to actually take a quick break to pay some bills, but when we return, we'll be uh, joined by Jasmine Burke of Weaves and Shad. No flipping, everyone. Stay where you are. Long Night would 100% not be possible without the generous support and encouragement of Toronto's amazing multidisciplinary arts festival, Long Winter. Visit torontolongwinter.com for more info. (laughs) 
We're back here on Long Night with our guest, Carl Wilson, the author of a piece for Billboard magazine entitled, Is Rock Music Still Relevant in 2016? Which is an essay that we still find relevant in the year 2017. <laughs> We're joined now by two people with thoughts about the topic. Jasmine Burke is in the wonderful Toronto rock band Weaves, and Shad is a hip-hop artist, pop musician, and one of the greatest rappers in history. Please say hello to Jasmine and Shad. Thank you so much. Welcome to the show. Thanks for, thanks for being here. Now, Jasmine, you're a rocker. What do you make? You're a bit of a rocker. Let's, let's just... Let's just get, get that out of the way. What do you make of this discussion? Do you feel like Carl's piece is on point? I feel like it's not dead, but I also think that it would prosper if it had a little bit better representation of people. You know, I think it's lost. People think it's regurgitated, but it's often the same people that get signed to labels. It's always a cute young guy over, you know, a female. And I find even just playing festivals... I'll be the only female on the stage for the day. Right. And that's just a crazy statistic to find yourself within. It's like, how are there not more women? And even just seeing young girls at shows, they'll come up to me and say, you know, I've never seen a, a, a woman of color in a rock band that's like doing all right, you know? And so I feel like we need to actually have more women that are hired, that are bringing more women on board, and maybe then it would have a fresh... Outlook, you know. How does that make you feel when someone comes up to you? I mean, I don't know if you had heroes when you were younger and seeing bands. Like, was there someone like you for you when you were younger? No, and that's probably the sad. I don't think there was anybody that I necessarily looked like that. You know, I liked Courtney Love and, um, you know, Veruca Salt, but I never necessarily identified with them as far as what I physically right. looked like. And so when you see young girls at shows and they have big froze and they just you know, they're kind of alternative, that's inspiring because they want to see more of that. And I think they would come to shows and they would report, they would enjoy rock music if there was a little bit more diversity. <laughs> yeah, I can, <laughs> you I can know? hear there. Yeah. yeah. Shad, do you have thoughts on what Jasmine has said or Carl? Yeah, I agree 100% with what Jasmine just said. And, and Carl actually spoke to that a, a bit in his piece too. Um, I thought Carl's piece was great and was, you know, there's many different layers to what he was saying. I agree with virtually all of them, and I was telling him backstage, I saw uh, Prince maybe three years ago. Air Canada Center? No, this was in Vancouver. At, uh, Sorry the, to interrupt. The, the, no, all good, all good. Um, <laughs> I wanted, at the, to, I wanted yeah, to relate because I was at the... At the <laughs> same Prince moment. No, this was, this was a different Prince moment, and he was, he was touring like a four or five piece rock band. Yeah. And I was watching them play, and he was doing like this bluesy, soulful rock and roll, and I was watching it, and I was thinking exactly what Carl wrote, which is, oh, cool, this is like culture, this is like, uh, you know, heritage, this is a style of music that existed before, and he's performing it super well, but it's not really what's going on right now. So that's what I thought of first and foremost when I read uh, Carl's piece. I think there is some truth to that, that it is becoming this kind of heritage Guitar-based, I would say, is becoming this kind of heritage music that still has all sorts of value, but it's not the center of what's happening. Do you, does anyone here think we're floating in some sort of nebulous, traditionalist, no tradition, untraditional, out of tradition? Like, are we in a weird realm in music right now where the stuff that's really popping isn't really from anything? Like, even the hip-hop doesn't quite sound like the hip-hop that is often referred to as the golden age of hip-hop. Like, do you feel like maybe there's, people are just breaking away from every parameter? And well, I think that? it goes back to what we were saying before, is that I think that young people now really aren't thinking in genre terms nearly as much. You know, the biggest so-called rock band on the charts the past couple of years is 21 Pilots, which, you know, involves no guitars, <laughs> involves, like, pre-recorded tracks and beats, and, like, and rapping. You know, but because they come from alternative radio, they get classed as a rock band. But they also are influenced by like emo bands and that kind of thing beforehand. So they're from these traditions in these overlapping ways. And I think we're probably going to see more and more of that. Although I wanted to add to what Jasmine said that I do think that like the thing that's not at all exhausted is women making rock music. And for the past decade, that's been the stuff that's still exciting coming out of rock scenes in general. Is Because I think there's just a whole lot of expressive possibility that women have found in rock that isn't exhausted retreads of what happened in the 60s and 70s and 80s. You know? But it is progressing, right? I mean, you are, we are seeing more women 
in rock music, mm -hmm. right? I think so, but at the same time, sometimes labels, if they have one, they don't want any more than that. <laughs> it's like, we have this person, and you know, that's enough for our roster. You know? So that's probably a problem huh. too. So is the solution some form of vocational displacement? Do these people gotta go, you know? Or like, do we gotta put someone else in those positions? Is that what we're calling for? Well, I mean, obviously we need more people at the top that are making decisions that would be more inclusive, right? Yeah. It's a bunch of old people that are running the labels and stuff, so, and festivals, so I think it's just sort of, it's not thought about, but when you're there and you are slightly different, you start to look around like, there's not even a mirror here because I'm the only person who wants to look in a mirror before I go on stage. That's odd. It's weird. I mean, the good thing is that, like, arguably labels are becoming less important and that sort of artists putting things out themselves and putting things out on streaming services creates a lot more opportunity. Like, one of the weird things about the sales figures with rock is that part of the reason that they don't show up on the charts nearly as much is that people listen to a much wider range of rock. Like in pop and in hip hop, people tend to listen to like the same 10 artists. Huh. But in rock, people are listening to like 500 different things. So even though the numbers, as like genre listen listenership on a service like Spotify are like fairly equivalent to everything except pop, like hip hop and rock and R&B are all kind of around the same level rock songs never get on the Spotify charts right. because nobody's all listening to the same rock song, well, which used, is kind of good and bad. You there know? used to be a thing, uh, it doesn't quite apply to, to this discussion, but there used to be a thing called appointment television where everyone was galvanized around a specific cultural moment and, and, and often it was like, who shot JR or whatever, like a TV show. You know, everyone was like tuned in and I have to think that the fragmented way we consume culture is impacting certain genres of music or certain streams of culture more so than others, right? I mean, is that, do you find that, Chad, that we just, I, I feel like we've talked about generalism a little bit and all these things coming together and how it's, we don't listen to genres anymore, but do you think this is just symptomatic of what's going on? The, the fragmentation of culture, yeah. too? Does that play into it? Um, like, is rock I think suffering th because of it in particular? Yeah, I think in the sense that, um, I don't know, people are, you guys were having that conversation about, you know, used to be, a, are you a rock guy? Are you a rap guy? Like, that was real, that was a real thing. We used to be in camps a little you bit. Were in, you were in <laughs> camps, and so then you had to have your closet, if you were a rap guy, you know, like I was, then I had to have my closet cranberries seed. You know what I mean? <laughs> sure. You know, and I sure. think that that doesn't happen so much anymore, so yeah, that, yeah. that probably makes people not champion um, their favorite. Yeah, you're less, music yeah. you're less ashamed. You don't have gu guilty pleasures. Seems to be a thing that have, that has melted away a little yeah. bit. You're more open about it. Yeah. Do you guys think that all music is undervalued equally, though, on some level? <laughs> I feel like all music is not really valued at all, and that this is part of the deal too. This is something I think about this all the time, but you're really just in bafflement. Like, I feel like, but I have no way to measure this. I feel like music's place in culture in general is much diminished from where it was a couple of decades ago. Yeah. And that like television and video games, a few other things maybe have like taken, you know, in technology itself, just like paying attention to technology as a thing, have all taken a lot of the attention and devotion and sort of ways that people constructed their identities away from music to some degree. But then, you know, when I talk to somebody in their teens or 20s, you know, they're still pretty passionate about music. And so I'm like, ah, oh, maybe this is just like my like version of some nostalgic thing. I'm not sure. I don't know if this is controversial, but I think music consumers, serious music consumers may have led the way a little bit in terms of the way we consume all culture now. Because as you were saying, you had your closet cranberry CD, which is hilarious, by the way. But I remember distinctly in high school, and I'm not trying to sound cool here, I am not a cool person. <laughs> But at some point, I just was like, I'm going to listen to everything. And I loved hip hop and I loved punk rock and I just did it, you know? And I feel like a lot of music, serious music fans were like that. They would just had really open minds to everything. And then in the 90s in particular, we saw an explosion of this occurring across cultures, uh, cultural forms, where it was okay to like Tarantino and, I don't know, some, some other film person. Yeah. Yeah. I <laughs> 
I Tarantino so. and I Adam Sandler. Think of, I yeah, think. Adam Sandler, sure. <laughs> I, think, I also think a lot of the, the strict divisions have sort of disappeared. You know, that like the difference between, sonically, between, say, Drake and Lord and, say, Fantagram is like pretty small. Right, right. And you're talking about three distinct, semi-distinct genres of music, yeah, right? right? I think that's happened a lot, too, in music. Um, and you're downloading music, you know, it's like mm -hmm. when you, I think before you downloaded everything, maybe your sibling would tell you like, this is the music you need to listen to, or your dad or your mother would let you know like, this is what's up. And then that kind of was diminished when yeah. the internet came yeah. along and it's like, well, I'm just going to download we stuff. We download everything. I downloaded this teleprompter app yes. earlier today. <laughs> it sort of works. I, I'm being told we have to take a break, actually. Let me look at my app here. We're going to take... A short break right now, back with more in a moment. Stick around. <laughs> Promotional consideration is provided by Planet Bean, a Guelph-based coffee company with service throughout Ontario. Fair trade, organic, and yummy. Visit planetbeancoffee.com for more info. We're back on Long Night, and we have a bit of time left to discuss whether or not rock and roll is dead. The, uh, the elephant god in the room is, uh, <laughs> is that uh, we have talked about rock's diminished status, but we haven't really pinpointed how well hip-hop is doing, mm -hmm. I think, these days. And it's uh, pervasiveness. And I feel like we talk like hip-hop. We don't even think about it anymore. You know what I mean? It just infiltrates the culture, the, the popular culture in, in such a way. Shad, do you have thoughts on Yeah, the well, Carl's of article actually made me think about hip-hop as well because hip-hop has gone through so many changes and, of course, people have talked about hip-hop being dead many times yeah, exactly. over. Yeah. But I do think 2016 was a new level of hip-hop changing into something where what you and I would you know, recognize as hip-hop or sort of fundamentally hip-hop, classic hip-hop, is pretty, again, similar to rock, pretty far from the mainstream, pretty right. far from, from what's going on. And there's a couple moments that really highlighted that for me. There was this uh, XXL cipher that they do with the best 10 new rappers you know, every year. And the cipher format, for the first time, it didn't work for what these rappers were doing. Because you know, designer was in the cipher, and he was doing the designer thing, which is like not what you do in a rap cipher. He was basically repeating the same four lines over and over again, then doing his cool ad lib, which is like not what you do in a cipher. Right. And then uh, Anderson Pack came in, and he's arguably more of a singer, yeah. you know. So again, hip hop is to me classic hip hop is kind of um, further from the mainstream, further from what people recognize as kind of what's happening right now. The way does that suggest that hip hop is also in a strange state? Or is that what you're saying? I I think absolutely. Or I might you might say that like hip hop is still. Yeah. Vital, but rap is maybe yeah. <laughs> moving into kind of a totally more heritage zone. Like kind what, of thing. what we know as ra it's, it's as rapping a as rapping <laughs> yeah, is like yeah, a yeah. more is a more heritage. It's thing, usually I think. it's always usually the artists on the vanguard suggesting that the music is dead. Like when swing music died, it was because everyone wanted to play bebop. I'm not trying to do a really terrible music lesson right now, <laughs> but like you know, rock and roll is dead, so punk rock comes about, and similarly, I mean. Hip hop was a distinction from rap music. Yeah, yeah. Hip hop was the pure, unadulterated form, and then to take away from, or rather to counter the pop success of rap, right? So it's always, it always seems like there's artists who are making these calls of like, this has to die so we can do something really good. Yeah, and I think sometimes the art form also progresses to a certain point yeah. where it's kind of reached its limit, technically speaking, you right. know? I think jazz maybe did that. Rapping has probably done that. That you can't rap any better than people have rapped. <laughs> that's probably true. That's probably true. Okay, well, we, uh, that's a good point, Chad. We actually have to take uh, a... We don't have to. That sounds harsh. We are very willingly 
going to take a couple of questions uh, from some audience members. Who do we have over there, James? I'm Claudia. Hi, Claudia. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Are you from Guelph? Yeah, I am. Hi. <laughs> Did you get my email? I got your email. Okay. I will respond to your email. I'm a little busy this week, but okay, I no, will. I understand. I'll do an interview with you. Okay. It'll be just like this. Do you want to do it now, actually? <laughs> I mean. We'll do it later. Okay. Claudia from Guelph. We should have carpooled. And who's over here? <laughs> My name's Mac. Hi, Mac. How are you? I'm pretty good, Vish. How are you? I'm very well. All right. Uh, let's start with Claudia. Okay. So now that festivals are announcing their lineups, do you think big name festivals um, like Coachella or Oceaga, to name a few, are being more inclusive with their lineups, or do you think they still have somewhere to go with that? That's a good point. I mean, Jasmine, you spoke to this earlier. What do you think? Uh, they definitely need to be more inclusive, I think. I'm, I'm assuming when we see the lineups, it'll be the same sort of thing of, um, yeah, just similar. I think, I don't know. It, <laughs> things need to change, but who knows when, I don't know. Hopefully. There are little pointed something. moments of progress. I mean, yeah. people have been doing this thing with the festival posters where they take away all of the, yeah, uh, sure, like, they try to highlight how few women or minorities are playing. And it's usually like on a 50 band bill, it's like two people fit like an underrepresented uh i think that's great i mean those little memes or whatever is that what you guys call them? memes but i mean does it, does it actually i mean those images have come out but how much has changed since those memes came into fruition i would like just you, like, it's incremental intangible progress yeah. right you yeah. you would hope that enough people spread these things around and it starts to get back to programmers and curators yeah, it's, like, you know it just sort of depends on how craven the promoters are you know because like ultimately they are doing what they think will like sell yeah. and yeah. there are a few of them like Oshega might be one who I think like are going to pay attention to that kind of feedback but a lot of those companies are not our friends right. you know I also think in North America I don't know in Europe I find like there are more women um, that were at that, like we did this one end of the road last year and it was like us dilly dally and us girls back to back on this festival and it felt so empowering like three canadian women and we're in the uk and we're you know like showcasing our country but you hope that also your country supports you and like right. i don't know it's yeah. sort of this weird back it is complicated uh, claudia are you satisfied with that response or do you want us to try again no I, it's good okay thank you very much claudia claudia have a hand for claudia there Uh, Mac, can you give us your question, please? Yeah, I'm wondering if uh, each of you could give perhaps an example of a rock band that uh, a rock band that might disprove the argument that rock is dead and why you think. Okay, that. each of us. I have to do this. If you want, you don't have to. I don't have to. It's my show. Okay, <laughs> let's start with Shad. Oh, I'm still contemplating. <laughs> Good response, Carl. Um. Jasmine just mentioned U.S. Girls, um, who I often think of as, as a group that's like finding new sounds and, and expressing new thoughts in rock, and I get excited when I see them. Okay. Okay, that's good. Uh, Jasmine? Um, I would say probably the Lemon Twigs, even though it's two young boys, but um, we were talking about that. Most of their audience at the show in Toronto was like 45 plus, and it's like this revival of rock. But um, I think they could kind of do something interesting with music. And Sunflower Bean, they're another band that I really like that okay. kind of pushing forward. Cool. Shad, you got something? Um, I'd probably say um, Savages is the first band that comes to mind yeah. from the UK. Also, um, I saw this guy, Jason Isbell, mm -hmm. who is, you know, uh, first name, last name, white dude with a guitar, but he is he does what he does, and he writes incredible songs and that will always be you know meaningful right yeah, and that brings up an interesting thing too which we haven't addressed is like if you want to see where rock culture where the working with those materials is gone also look at country like a, yeah. lot, a lot of the great things that are happening in country now like 20 years ago they, those would have been rock artists you know this, this this the distinction is not that wide, and a lot of the like big guitar sound music has moved into country now. Okay. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna try this. Thank you. I'm gonna say The Lonely Parade, which is a band from Peterborough. It's three young women, and they, uh, they've they known each other since they were kid, little kids, and they went into a girls' rock camp, which, by the way, does it, if you're not familiar with girls' rock camp, this is an amazing 
uh, venture, basically. Yeah, sure. How about a round of applause for Joey Gatto? I don't know where this exactly came from, but I know that they're popping up. These girls' rock camps are popping up in different communities, certainly across our country. And uh, it's just what it sounds like. It's, it's an opportunity for young women to play music. And uh, the Lonely Parade are among the most sophisticated rock bands I've ever heard. And they're like 18 or 19 or something. So when I see something like that, I'm filled with a lot of hope. So anyway, Mac, thank you for your question. And uh, yeah, thank you. For more information about our guests tonight, you can follow them on Twitter, uh, at Carl Zoilis, at Shad K Music, and at Weaves. You can also follow me, at Vishkana, and you can follow the Long Winter Festival that helps put on Long Night, at Long Winter T.O. Uh, thanks to ev uh, again to everyone for uh, working on the show, watching the show. We'll see you next time. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. <laughs>